The first module I will be covering today is a brief overview of the U.S. electric grid and how it functions. Here's a simple electrical system diagram that shows the electrical system at a very basic level. The process begins at a generator where the power plant converts some type of fuel into electricity. For WAPA, the generators are housed within hydroelectric dams and the fuel is water. Transmission lines carry electricity from the dam to a switchyard, which increases voltage for transmission across the country. Electricity is then delivered to local utilities at substations, which decrease the voltage for safe distribution to homes, businesses in cities and towns. The electricity generated by all the different types of generators on the electrical system provides the electricity we need to light our houses, run electric motors and appliances, and operate all of the other devices that we are so dependent on in our daily lives. One of the most important aspects of generation and transmission of wholesale electricity is that there's very little capability to store electricity. What this means is that the generation of electricity has to exactly match the consumption of electricity in real time. So when you flip on a light in your house, a little more generation must be added to the system to compensate for that. When the electrification of the U.S. was first beginning, it was mostly a local generator serving local load in real time. For example, municipalities would own a generator that would generate the electricity needed to operate the street lamps, and the generator and load would be totally independent of any other generators or loads. As the need for electricity expanded, so did the companies providing electricity. The first utilities were essentially monopolies owning all the generation, transmission, and distribution assets needed to serve the load within their designated service territory. Since the utilities owned and operated all the assets from beginning to end, they were known as vertically integrated utilities. And although vertically integrated utilities still exist today, they are not as prevalent as they once were. By constructing larger generator and transmission assets, utilities could realize economies of scale. Unfortunately, building these big projects and building the, the size that they needed was quite capital intensive and utilities soon discovered that by sharing resources and the capital investment costs of building these assets, they could more cost effectively build generation and transmission assets. They soon began to pool their resources and in 1927, PGM formed the first power pool. As utilities began to construct generation, and transmission, and distribution in the most populated areas, there were large areas of the country that were not being electrified because it was not profitable to construct these assets. In order to ensure rural communities weren't left behind, the federal government enacted the Rural Electrification Act of 1936. The Rural Electrification Act allowed individuals, corporations, states, and nonprofit cooperatives to access low interest loans. This allowed small communities in the rural West to construct generation, transmission, and distribution assets that for profit utilities were unwilling to construct. It also allowed individuals access to low interest loans to purchase appliances and electrical equipment for their newly electrified homes. With the help of the Rural Electrification Act, electricity began to spread across the U.S., and the small individual systems that were constructed to serve local communities began to grow more and more interconnected as they expanded. Today, the bulk electric system spreads across the U.S., Canada, and parts of Mexico, and is made up of four distinct interconnections. It is comprised of the Eastern Interconnection, the Western Interconnection, the Texas Interconnection, and the Quebec Interconnection. WAPA, at that time the Bureau of Reclamation, played and continues to play a major role in the construction and operation of a large portion of the generation and transmission that is interconnected and powered the Western Interconnection. These interconnections are distinct from each other and operate independently, and there are only a limited number of connections between them. But although they are separated from each other, all four of the major interconnections in the U.S. and Canada run on a 60 hertz frequency. Here is a graphical representation of the interconnection. As you can see, the western interconnection is the largest geographically, but in terms of load, it is the second biggest. The eastern connection is the first largest in terms of load with 600,000 megawatts of load, 
The Western Interconnection is second with 140,000, followed by the Texas Interconnection with 75,000 megawatts of load, and finally the Quebec Interconnection with 40,000.